good evening to all it's immense pleasure we welcome you all for the national webinar on one health organized by department of community medicine kmct medical college calicut kerala before the commencement of program we request the participant to mute the mic and switch off video camera switch off video camera please post your comments and queries in chat box and we'll be addressing at the end at the end of session we will be sharing a link for feedback and please fill up and submit the feedback which is mandatory for issuing the e certificate for the full time participants i would like to invite dr jayakrishnan t professor and hod department of community medicine kmct medical college kolkata for the welcome speech and chair the session over to you sir good evening the second half of last century marks the era of celebration of antibiotics during that time medical scientists were euphoric they perceived that the infectious diseases were a closed chapter but following years the later part of last century world experienced an avalanche of infectious diseases and which are emerging or emerging either old or new diseases out of this 70% are zoonotic diseases they are mainly due to spill over or accidental or incidental spill over from mainly animals most of were due to man made ecological disruptions in the current era the travel trade tourism act as escalators of this spill over and for examples recent few examples in 1997 the bird flu emerged in hong kong through birds in 1998 nipa virus emerged in malaysia through bats and 2003 sars emerged in china china through civet cats and to 2009 h1n1 at mexico through pigs and 2013 mers at oman through camels and 2014 ebola at africa through bats and 2019 covid-19 pandemic emerged in wuhan china the origins is still at conflict and perceived to be through bats and recently in 2022 monkeypox emerged in european union that is also the the, the route of transmission is also in questions and even in the 21st era 2023 monthly world health organization received more than 7000 signs of potential outbreaks now after globalization where we can travel around the world within 24 hours all are swimming in the same sea of microbes so addressing the challenges of spill over the single answer is one health so the first purpose of the program is to sensitize the scientific community about the importance of one health and its practical implementation and secondly historically the response to human civilization is highly reactive though we have just tied over one pandemic uh, not a tied over just we are passing through the pandemic we are now in the face of pandemic amnesia most of us are forget about the all the sufferings all the measures we had taken during the pandemic so remind us all and equip to face the next episodes and keeping us vigilance we are conducting this program and first of all i welcome chairman and managing trustee of kmct dr nawaz km and trustee director dr aisha nasreen who support us with all resources for conducting this program and next i welcome our beloved principal dr vijay sir who is with us supporting with us always with smiles smiley face and who is giving the inaugural session inaugural address session next i will come uh, our resource person dr arun t ramesh and dr anish who are the experts in the fields i have experience of working with is both of them along with other, other public health experts as an advocacy of one health in kerala and both are instrumental in bringing one health as an agenda before kerala state government authorities early in 2019 uh, next day welcome 
all the participants from India and abroad, and from Kerala and other states of India. And as our team is One Health, our participants include medical students, doctors, veterinary doctors, researchers, environmental scientists, as well as health activists. And lastly, or not leastly, I welcome my team members at KMCT Medical College and my colleagues and PGs and other students at Community Medicine Department. And let's say invite our principal, Dr. Viji sir, to deliver inaugural address. Thank you, Jay Krishna, sir. Good evening, respected resource persons, uh, dear Jay Krishna, sir, and friends. It feels good to be part of this webinar on One Health. A One Health Day is observed annually on the 3rd of November to raise global awareness about the importance of One Health collaborations. This global awareness campaign brings attention to the need for a One Health approach to address the shared health threats at the human, animal, and environment interface and to promote best practices across all these sectors. The theme for this year is Act Together for One Health. Now, One Health is indeed a sustainable way of living together on this planet. It can be seen as a lifestyle that we should all adopt. Now, individuals like us can definitely contribute in many different ways by ensuring that the wildlife remain in their natural habitats by avoiding deforestation and also by not participating in wildlife trading. Following the antibiotic treatments prescribed by health professionals and completing your dosage as prescribed, thereby avoiding development of antimicrobial resistance by practicing healthy pet habits and ensuring our pets are vaccinated, avoiding carbon intensive transit by like try uh, more walking, all can help. Now, everyone has a role to play in getting One Health uh, awareness across the world. India can definitely play a, play a major role in this effort. We Indians have been practicing our age-old philosophy of Vasudeva Kudumpakam, which translates as the world is one, is one family, one earth, one family, one future. So by protecting one, we protect all. That should be our outlook where all living beings, along with the environment in which we live, is taken care of in the best possible way. I wish to congratulate uh, Dr. Jay Krishnan, sir, and his team at the Department of Community Medicine at KMCT Medical College for taking the initiative in organizing this webinar for increasing awareness of the concept of One Health. Wishing the webinar all the success. May God bless. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We are privileged to have Dr. Arun TR as our resource person. Currently working as Scientist B, Bacteriology Group, ICMR, National Institute of Virology, Pune. He completed his post-graduation and PhD from Indian Veterinary Research Institute, Bareilly, and he is an elected member of the Veterinary Council of India and a member of the Board of Management, Kerala Veterinary and Animal Science Veterinary, uh, Animal Science University. He was also the part of state-level campaign on One World, One Health. There are many research publications added to his credit. It's my immense pleasure to welcome you, sir. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, respected Dr. T. Jai Vishnan, sir. Respected Dr. Vijesh Vandagopal, sir. Respected Dr. Bindu Mohandas, ma'am. Dearest Dr. Anish, sir. Senior faculty members and my dear friends. A very good evening to all. And first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Jai Vishnan, sir, and the organizers of this event for giving me this opportunity to participate in the webinar. I'm very glad that Dr. B. Pearl, sir, will be attending this webinar. He was the one of the pioneer in dissemination of the concept of One Health in Kerala. And as uh, Jagishman, sir, mentioned earlier, it was under Dr. B. Pearl, sir's guidance. Uh, Kerala South Society Budget has launched a statewide campaign on One Health, One World. And we conducted more than 4,000 classes in various schools, colleges, public libraries, and different organizational platforms, which I believe to be the largest public health awareness campaign on one health globally. So, and uh, I would like to use this opportunity to thank faculty members and postgraduate students from community medicine departments 
in various medical colleges in Kerala because they actively participated in that campaign. So during that campaign, we focused on zoonotic diseases of for pandemic potential and diseases like Nipah and KFD to grab the attention of the public. But today, I would like to focus more on antimicrobial resistance. As I hope, it may inspire the audience to have awareness campaigns during the upcoming Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week from 18 to 24th November. So, coming to the topic. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> coming to the definition of One Health, it's a collaborative, multi sectoral, transdisciplinary approach working at the local, regional, national, and global levels with the goal of achieving optimal health outcome outcomes, recognizing the interconnection between people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. I would say very uh, long definition, but we have to focus on two major points here. One is recognizing the interconnection between human health, animal health, and the environmental health. We have to understand that we cannot protect human health with, without protecting the health of animals and the environment. The second focus point is the transdisciplinarity of the approach. It's not about people from multiple sectors working together for a common goal. It's not about people from multiple sectors communicate to achieve a common goal, but it's about working under the same umbrella. People from multiple sectors, that may be scientists, academicians, politicians, policy makers, they have to come together a single umbrella to achieve a optimal health for humans, animals, and the environment. So, under the broad umbrella of One Health, it comes like uh, human medicine, veterinary medicine, ecology, environmental sciences, public health, molecular biology, microbiology, health economics, and it addresses a wide range of public health concerns like antimicrobial resistance, zoonotic infections, environmental health, food safety, food security, and much more. So, excuse me, excuse me sir. Yeah. The, the slides are not changing, sir. It's visible here the history of one uh, health. So the first, uh, we are seeing the first slide that the uh, one health basic concepts. Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. Now it's visible. Okay, sorry. Thank you, sir. Okay, so. It's a, I think the definition is clear. So coming to the history of One Health concept, it emerged as a concept called One Medicine, recognizing the oneness of human medicine and veterinary medicine. And it was Rudolf Virchow, the father of modern pathology, the founder of social medicine, and the father of cellular pathology, was the first one to suggest a concept called one medicine. He was from a family of butchers, slaughterhouse workers. Most of his paternal family members were working in the slaughterhouses. Later, he graduated as a medical professional, but he continued his interest in veterinary medicine. He used to, being a faculty of medical college, he used to attend lectures in veterinary college. He used to attend the autopsies in uh, veterinary colleges. And he was the one who identified the life cycle of a somatic nematode, trichinella spiralis. He was the one who coined the term zoonosis. And he was the pioneer who advocated meat inspection. And he was a public health activist as a parliamentarian. He, he had a big role in shaping the 
veterinary practice to veterinary science. And there are historians who consider him as the father of modern veterinary medicine. Then one of his students, William Osler, he was a Canadian physician, one of the founders of John Hopkins Hospital. And he's also recognized as the father of modern medicine. He taught in both medical college and veterinary college. And he's considered as a uh, father of veterinary pathology in North America. He was the one who coined the term modern medicine. Later, uh, Dr. Calvin Schrabe was the father of veterinary epidemiology. He popularized or revived the concept of one medicine, and he proposed a unified human and veterinary approach to counter zoonosis. So when we look back to the history of uh, One Health, we can see two groups of medical and veterinary scientists who were behind the idea of One Health. One was microbiologist or pathologist who saw things in a microscopic level and identified the oneness of human and veterinary health. And there was pe people from social medicine or community medicine who could see things in a broader perspective and identify the sir. oneness of Excuse me, sir. Sorry for interrupting. Sir, slides yeah. are again changing and we would uh, the participants are requesting for a slideshow also, sir. So, uh, Is it okay now? Uh, yes, sir. It's, it's okay, sir. Slideshow also, sir, please. Yeah, it's in the side. Is it changing now? Um, no, no, sir. No, okay. Uh, sir, if any technical uh, problem is there, uh, we are able to share the slide. If you allow us. Yeah, yeah one minute. I will just try once more. Okay, sir. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Is it visible now? Uh, it's visible, sir. Uh, the problem is it's not changing in uh, sir, slideshow also. Is it okay now? No, sir. Top bar slideshow. There is a top bar. There is a slideshow. Please use that. Yeah. Click yeah, on yeah. that. Is it changing now? No. Yes, sir. Yes. Changing, right? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. okay. Fine. So, the concept of one medicine dates back to the 18th century, but like as the veterinary and human medicine advanced, it uh, developed into two separate branches, and the concept of one health or one medicine faded away. So, and the major One Health initiatives were started again as a response of two disease outbreaks. One was the uh, SARS outbreak from 2002 to 2004 and continuous outbreaks of highly pathogenic avian influenza from 2003 to 2006, which was considered to be a pandemic threat to the humanity. So, in response to this epidemics. One Health Initiative Task Force was formed in 2006 by American Medical Association and America, uh, American Veterinary Medical Association. Later, a One Health Commission was formed in 2007. And later, World Health Organization and World Organization for Animal Health and Food and Agriculture Organization joined hands for One Health. And in 2016, the One Health Commission 
One Health platform and the One Health initiative started the International One Health Day, which was celebrated on November 3rd. In the right side, you can see a graph which shows the publications titled One Health for the last 50 years. You can see a steep increase in the last few years on research articles and publications on One Health. It was, as you know, it was a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We see uh, COVID-19 pandemic as a uh, human uh, infectious agent, which killed more than 6 million people around the globe. And it changed our lives forever. And there was an increase in the uh, increase attention to the One Health uh, concept during the pandemic because uh, because of the origin of the pandemic. It was supposed to be originated from a wildlife market in Wuhan. But it was not a surprising event for the scientific community because many years before, there were publications which predicted that the wildlife markets from China may be the origin of the next pandemic. So it's not, not only about the origin of the uh, pandemic. During the COVID-19 pandemic, there was initially some experimental infections in animals where they found that some of the animals can be susceptible to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And later on, we found that many pet animals wild animals and farmed animals were contracting COVID-19. And by the end of 2021, there were 15 animal species in the US which contracted COVID-19. And there, then it spread to the uh, wild animals. This is a white-tailed deer in the United States and many other wild animals which also contracted uh, SARS-CoV-2. In the latest data says that there were 769 outbreaks of COVID-19 in animals. More than two, uh, around 3,500 infections were reported. Uh, it's, it, they were not subclinical infections. It came with a 1.4 percentage case fatality. So COVID-19 is no more a pandemic that affected only humans. It affected uh, more than 34 species of animals. So the major threat was that like the means and many other species who got SARS-CoV-2 infections from humans were able to transmit it back to humans uh, with, with whom they were interacting. The major threat was that like uh, the scientific community feared that it may lead to the emergence of a more pathogenic strain of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, with uh, very dangerous effects in humanity. So it's not about the COVID-19 pandemic. When we see the history of human humankind, we can see a lot of pandemics and most of them were zoonotic. When we consider the uh, black death, the bubonic plague that almost killed 50 percentage of humans in many countries and continents, it was zoonotic in origin. Smallpox virus, uh, it also originated back to a uh, pox virus in rodents and Spanish flu, of course, you know, it was a, uh, it's also having a zoonotic origin. And most of these uh, deadly pandemics were the effect of spillovers from wildlife or other animals. So from the plague, uh, you know, it's, like, it, it's called black death. Uh, it killed more than 50 percentage of people in Europe. And in, when we, the slide so is visible, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, fine. So we know the uh, plague epidemic in India in 1994. It was, it triggered one of the biggest post-partition migration of people in India with around 3 lakh people leaving Surat city in one or two days. And we have to know that the Yersinia pestis strains are there in Providence, which was identified in Kosur and Palmer regions in the Deccan Plateau. So from plague to the another 
which is considered as pandemic AIDS, it, it, it also originated from uh, non-human primates and HIV took from the chimpanzees. So it's not only about the uh, uh, pandemics caused by uh, human uh, pathogens, also pandemics in animals also had a profound impact on the history of humans. So coming to the Rinderpest virus, it uh, originated from an ancestor virus uh, from which the mumps virus also originated. And uh, it has a very uh, big impact on the history of me uh, veterinary medicine. It, it led to the first establishment of first veterinary school in Lyon in France in 1762. Uh, it was the cause of uh, establishment of Imperial Bacteriological Laboratory in 1889 in India and the World Animal Health Organization. It was also, also a response to the a outbreak of Rinderpest and one of the first institutes in vaccine and serum production in India, Mysore Serum Institute. It was also a response to the Rinderpest epidemics that was happening in India. As you know that Dr. P. Palpu was regarded as a well-known social reformer in India, was a medical doctor. He served as the uh, chief of this Mysore Serum Institute. So, uh, pandemics of pandemics that happened in animals has also have a very huge impact in the history of humans. So, the spillovers or species gems of pathogens from domestic animals and wild animals it happened throughout the history of humans. But as uh, Jayashin sir mentioned in his inaugural speech. There are some certain factors which accelerated the uh, number of uh, zoonotic events or spillover events, that's population growth and the huge increase in the food animal production and the changes that happened in the biodiversity. If you see in that figure, it's a representation of the biomass in the planet. As you can see, the animals, they contribute about to gigaton of carbon, it's estimated as a uh, measure of carbon uh, in weight. So after the, like after Homo sapiens, the, there was a huge change in the uh, biodiversity of the planet. So there was a increase in 8.5 times in the human biomass. And along with that, the domestic animals uh, biomass it was increased 14 times, diminishing the uh, biodiversity and number of wild animals. So it has also contributed to the uh, increased events of spillovers and also uh, the global travel, wildlife markets, illegal wildlife, wildlife trade, poaching. These are all contributory factors that increase the incidence of zoonotic spillovers. So I'll be just briefly going through the important zoonotic diseases. So as you know, uh, an estimated 60 percentage of non-infectious diseases in humans are of zoonotic origin. While we uh, consider the emerging infectious diseases, 75 percentage are, are, are of zoonotic origin and 70 percentage come from the wildlife. When you consider the priority pathogens, most of them are of zoonotic origin. And these diseases are responsible for an estimated 2.5 billion cases of illness worldwide. This is the data of uh, communicable diseases in uh, the state of Kerala. As you go through the list, you can find most of them are zoonotic diseases. When we come to the 10 priority zoonotic diseases of India, which was uh, formulated by NCDC. These are the most important diseases. One is zoonotic influenza, anthrax, Japanese encephalitis, leptospirosis, brucellosis, dengue, rabies, strep typhus, plague, and CCHF. Uh, I don't think there is a uh, more explanation is needed in these diseases. I would uh, proceed. So influenza is like as I said earlier, uh, the scientific community 
consider influenza viruses and coronaviruses as having highest uh, potential to cause a uh, future pandemic because uh, because of the uh, high antigenic shift and trip happening because there is a high chance that uh, uh, influenza viruses from uh, poultry and pig and human they may uh, undergo recombination to create uh, a virus of pandemic potential which has high transmissibility in human population and having high pathogenicity. So the emergence of HPA has also had a uh, big impact due to the uh, changes happening in the wildlife and the habitat of uh, birds all over the globe. Mm, then comes KFT, scrub typhus, CCHF, rapis, you know, uh, is a major issue in Kerala for the last few years because uh, we can only uh, control rabies through a One Health approach. We can control the uh, human infections only by vaccinating the dogs and cats. And we can uh, control the state of population by having a proper waste management. So it's a, uh, it shows the interconnectedness of the human health, veterinary health, and the environmental health. As you know, leptospirosis is not, not only uh, a uh, pathogen which comes from the rodents, many uh, domestic animals like uh, cow, goats, dogs, they are the carriers of leptospira and uh, humans can get infections from all this contaminated environment. And brucellosis is another example of uh, One Health and there is a, a national campaign going on uh, which, uh, which is uh, being conducted in ruminants, uh, cattle, so that uh, we can vaccinate the entire ruminant population in India so that we can prevent the spread of brucellosis. And there comes anthrax, Japanese encephalitis, as a new Nipah virus, West Nile fever, tuberculosis, listeriosis, and uh, toxoplasmosis, and uh, many of the zoonotic diarrheal pathogens, uh, especially bacteria such as uh, E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Yersinia, Clostridium, and there are protozoa like Cryptosporidium and many endoparasites. They're also having uh, zoonotic origin. And there are a lot of uh, vector bone diseases, which are also have a, a big impact in the One Health approach. So, uh, <clears throat> when we consider the complex environmental factors involved in zoonotic disease transmission, we often see like uh, uh, KFD virus is there in monkeys, it's there in some rodent population, it's transmitted by uh, ticks or nymphs of ticks. But like we often fail to understand the homeless ecology of disease that have that's happening in the uh, environment because there are a lot of other species which are involved in the disease uh, dynamics. There are uh, predators of uh, monkeys. They may play an important role in the uh, transmission of disease. The predators who prey on uh, the rodents, they have an important role. And there are uh, many uh, bird species and other animals who feed on ticks. So it depends on the, uh, even minor changes in the population of any of these animals may contribute uh, in a spillover event where a human may be uh, infected with KFT virus. So we have to uh, holistically understand the complex ecology behind all these zoonotic diseases. Um, after that, there comes the most important aspect in the One Health context, that is antimicrobial resistance. It's one of the uh, top 10 global public health threats uh, defined by WHO. We are with with the uh, emerging multi drug resistant bacteria, we are going heading back to a pre-antibiotic era where there are no antibiotics to treat the 
even the common bacterial infections. It's often called a silent pandemic that's happened. And AMR pathogens are associated with an estimated uh, around 5 million deaths in 2019. And it is predicted to cause 10 million deaths each year by 2050. So we have to understand that the antimicrobial resistance can be shared between humans, animals, and the shared environment. Coming to the, uh, we have to understand that the antibiotics or uh, antibiotic producing bacteria, it came from the environment. It was from a, uh, most of the antibiotics, they were discovered in soil bacteria, you know, the example of penicillin, which was discovered in 1928 from a, uh, <clears throat> from penicillin rotatum. And it was, uh, it was, considered as a magic bullet in that time. And the scientific community uh, was searching for magic, more magic bullets in the environment, like soil bacteria and fungi. And then, uh, even though the, the penicillin was discovered in 1928, the actual use of penicillin in clinical practice came in the late 1940s. But, in the, in the year 1940, an E. coli strain, which was able to inactivate penicillin by producing penicillinase was discovered. So even before the clinical practice of penicillins, a penicillin resistant bacteria was reported. So this is a famous quote from Alexander Fleming during his novel uh, lecture in 1945. The thoughtless person playing with penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of the human who succumbs to infection with a penicillin resistant or cancer. So whenever we talk about antimicrobial resistance, the clinicians, uh, medical practitioners or veterinary practitioners are often blamed for the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. But like we have to identify the, we have to understand the environmental origin of antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. This is the oldest specimen uh, which was uh, contained penicillin. Uh, can anyone guess how old is this? It was from a fossil. It's a dental plague. The, the dental plague has traces of penicillin and salicylic acid. And the uh, individual was suffering from a tooth infection. Actually, it was from a Neanderthal man who lived 40,000 years ago and the fossil was containing penicillin. We don't know whether the Neanderthal man intentionally consumed a mold which contained uh, penicillin or it was an accidental finding, we don't know. But we have to understand that humans or pre-humans were exposed to antibiotics and antibiotic resistant bacteria. Antibiotic resistant genes were discovered in guts of many ancient mummies. Like uh, most of the commonly used antibiotics, like uh, beta lactamases, penicillin binding proteins, chloramphenicol resistance, aminoglycoside, and most of the antibiotic classes. So, resistance against all these antibiotics are discovered in ancient mummies. So, we have to uh, appreciate the fact that antibiotics and antibiotic resistant bacteria existed in Earth millions of years ago. So uh, the, the background is that like antibiotics are chemical compounds produced by microorganisms that inhibit or destroys another, other microbes in the environment. So the antibiotic producing bacteria should have mechanism for self-defense against these antibiotics. So all these soil bacteria had multiple mechanisms to ensure complete protection from the secondary metabolites, that is antibiotics. So this, all these antibiotic resistant genes were existing in environment millions of years ago, but um, we cannot deny that you deny that the increased use of antibiotics or the 
misuse of antibiotics, it promoted the spread of OMR because we have to see it in an evolutionary uh, perspective where they were. So there were antibiotic resistant bacteria, there were antibiotic resistant genes in the soil, in aquatic environment, but there was no selection pressure which selectively allowed the propagation of antibiotic resistant bacteria. But by the use of or misuse or abuse of antibiotics, we what we actually do is we are selecting antibiotic resistant bacteria in our environment. So when did this the, when, when did the antibiotic misuse started? Soon after the discovery of penicillin, it was considered as a magic drug. People were uh, advertising antibiotic containing products. Uh, it will stimulate hair growth. It will restore hair color. It will prevent aging. And the antibiotics were used in toothpaste, ice cream, detergents, even uh, lipsticks. So finally, in 1947, uh, in UK, a penicillin bill was passed to prevent the misuse of antibiotics. And soon after the discovery of uh, antibiotics, it uh, the drugs were used in uh, animals for therapeutic for, uh, purposes to treat bacterial infections, to uh, as a prophylactic agent to prevent animals which were in contact with the infected ones. And later, uh, it was used as the feed additive and which was the one of the major causes of antimicrobial resistance in animal husbandry. So actually, it's a, a very interesting story. Uh, the Merck company, they dis accidentally discovered that the byproduct of streptomycin production helped to uh, grow the chicken very faster. But it, it was not the antibiotic. It was actually vitamin B12 in the uh, growth after antibiotic production, which helped the uh, chicken to grow faster. Uh, later, an antibiotic was discovered. Uh, it was oreomycin. Uh, the actual drug is chlorotetracycline. It was found to uh, increase the growth of chicken. And there was a huge advertisement in the media. There was like a huge demand from the public to uh, for oreomycin. And there were, there were heated debates in the American parliaments where they, because uh, some states uh, blamed that we, they were not getting enough supply of oreomycin. So, Thousands of uh, liters of oreomycin was prepared and later it was approved for uh, using in the animal feed. So many of the uh, antibiotics which were uh, used in the treatment of humans and animals were used in the food animal industry as a growth promoter. Actually, it's not a growth promoter. Uh, the drugs were increasing the feed conversion efficiency because like... Uh, the antibiotics, even at the sub-therapeutic levels, they were able to uh, inhibit the growth of pathogenic organisms in the guts of birds and other animals. They were, uh, the microbial mass was reducing and the nutrients which were uh, used in the animal feed were able to support the animal growth in a uh, higher amount. So the use of antibiotics as a growth promoter was the main driver of spread of antimicrobial resistance. And while we uh, talk about the antibiotic use in India as a growth promoter, there was a report in 2014 conducted by the Center of Science and Environment in New Delhi. They detected most of the commonly used antibiotics in chicken meat. 40% of the samples were tested positive. And uh, and it they identified that the use of antibiotics in chicken feed was the cause of this uh, antibiotic residues in chicken meat. 
So it's not only about the uh, use of antibiotics in uh, animals or food animals. Uh, the antibiotics, even the commonly used ones, are widely used in uh, fish farming, uh, mainly inland fish farming. Many of the antibiotics are used in agriculture. So the major problem is that, like uh, as you know, the antibiotic resistance is not a intentional activity from the part of the microbe. It's an evolutionary process. So uh, when you are exposing a human with antibiotics, there's a chance that there's an antibiotic resistant bacteria in the gut that may be allowed to proliferate and it may spread into uh, other humans in contact or to the uh, shared environment. When you're treating an animal, with a certain antibiotic, there's a possibility that they, uh, it may lead to the emergence of a antibiotic resistance bacteria. But when you expose a uh, water body or soil in an agricultural field with antibiotics, there's a higher probability that it may lead to the emergence of an antibiotic resistance bacteria because, as you know, the soil and the aquatic environments contains many soil bacteria which are inherently resistant to the antibiotics. So the use of antibiotics in agricultural fields, of, uh, in the water bodies, and the uh, disposal of pharmaceutical effluents into the environments with rivers and other water, water bodies, they contributed actually in a huge level in the emergence of AMR. So, rather than the therapeutic use of antibiotics in human or veterinary practice, it is the uh, you the pollution antibiotic pollution that is happening in the environment that goes to the emergence of antibiotic resistance. As you know, the microbiome of humans, animals, and the environment, and the, even the plants are being shared between the all these uh, different kind of species. So there's only one way to counteract the issue of antimicrobial resistance. That is through a One Health approach, where, where we define the antibiotic use in human human health, where we define which antibiotics are used to be to be used in the uh, human medicine, veterinary medicine. We have to prevent the contamination of uh, agricultural fields, soil, and aquatic environments from the uh, antibiotics. Only by adopting a One Health approach, we can counteract the uh, emerging issue of AMR. So uh, let's conclude this uh, basic concept in One Health uh, by this concluded remark. It is not the strongest, strongest of the species who survive, nor the most intelligent. Rather, it is those most responsive to the things. So we have to identify the public health threats like AMR, zoonotic diseases, uh, food safety, and adopt a one health approach so that can so that we can ensure a better health for humans, animals, and the environment. So let's act together for one hand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the concepts of one hand. Your information you shared was very helpful for the postgraduates to the faculty level. So we are very thankful to you, sir. So for the participants, uh, we'll be sharing a link uh, after the second talk in the chat box. It is mandatory for all the participants to fill the feedback form through that link. We'll be issuing an e-certificate based on the people who submit the feedback form. So kindly fill the feedback form immediately after we share the link. <laughs>